meeting to order. I am aware that Councilmember Buba should be, I believe, joining us yes. on the phone. It is, can I get a, uh, just a read on who else is on Zoom with us? Ballard and Hoheiser. So Ballard and Hoheiser both are on Zoom. Excellent. Uh, then we'll uh, call this meeting to order and chair recognizes the clerk. Approve the minutes of regular meeting of November 8th, 2022. Is there any discussion about the minutes? <clears throat> if there's no discussion about the minutes, then I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as presented. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by the <clears throat> vice mayor. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same side. Aye. Aye. The ayes have it. The ayes do have aye. it. Aye. <laughs> Madam Clerk. Consents agenda items one through 19. As I remember, I had a chance to review the consent agenda, and if so, is there any discussion? Uh, Mr. Manager, can you just give us a brief overview of this couple items I thought were worth just chatting about because they're uh, ones that I've, I've heard uh, concerns about in the community. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, Humankind Ministries uh, winter shelter? Yes, I'm going to ask Sally Stang to talk about that contract. All right, so the manager hands it off to Director Stang. Is that item 11? Yes, it uh, is. Yes, item 11. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Uh, the Humankind Winter Shelter, uh, our ability to be able to provide funding for winter shelter this year is due to remaining emergency solutions grants, a CARES funding that we received in 2020. So if you remember, prior to 2020, the city did not fund winter shelter since 2009. And it was really in response to COVID-19 and the pandemic um, that we provided additional uh, funding for shelter. The difference in this year's funding uh, request, we specifically were asking for a provider to step forward to look at doing shelter a little bit differently than it's been done in the past. In the past, winter shelter has been really a hot and a cat and then wandering of the streets during the day. Uh, we really focused on what we learned through the Home Art Planning, that uh, housing-focused shelter, 24-7 operations, is, is a best practice. And so that's what we asked for in this RFP. So Humankind will be providing shelter starting 24-7 for, for the uh, emergency winter shelter. Uh, we'll have a housing focus, so we're requiring that 95% of those who come into shelter are entered into the coordinated entry system within 72 hours so that we can start working with other providers in the community to try and find housing options for those folks. We're also requiring weekly reports. So as you've heard many times as we've talked about our homeless systems, we have um, really poor data. So we're asking that they submit to us weekly um, reports through the HMIS system so we can know just how many people, uh, men, women, families, and families with pets that are, getting, are being served at the winter shelter. So it is a little bit different than we've done in the past. The shelter will run from December 1st uh, through March 31st as usual. And I'll stand for any questions you may have. March 31st. First, so 24-hour shelter, we're collecting better data with the anticipation of utilizing that data for, uh, for hopefully finding more mid to permanent housing for folks who are utilizing the shelter. Um, and it's from December 1st to March 31st. Is that accurate? That's correct. Excellent. Is there any further questions on this item? Councilmember Fry. Yes, thank you. Um, so obviously we're using CARES funding for this. Mm -hmm. That is not for the future. Correct. Right? I mean, that eventually runs out. That does so run out do in we... 2023. So there will be no winter shelter funding, at least from the housing department, for the 23-24 shelter period. So, I mean, that is something we can start budgeting for, or planning, or looking for alternative means if that's something we want to continue beyond that time frame. Um, Mayor, uh, council members, I, I think um, that will require us to have ongoing discussions with the homeless providers uh, because it, I think there's an issue of responsibility and who should be bearing the funding for that emergency shelter. And not that the, I'm saying the city shouldn't have a role, but I think we need to have a, a much more thorough discussion about that. And I'm glad to hear that because yeah. it is need to be collaborative. Yeah. Um, we've been taking this on for, and it's fine that we are, but we need to have more people at the table and, and planning for future asks. Right. So thank you. 
We absolutely agree. And, and the home art planning that we've been doing this year, we're hoping we're going to see some significant changes coming in the future in the entire homelessness ecosystem. I look forward to those discussions. Yes. Thank you. Um, further discussion on this item? Seeing none, I did want to get uh, just a quick overview on the golf budget adjustment. It looks like we're increasing the budget for golf. Uh, however, I, I think that uh, there's a really positive reason for that. So can we just get a, a briefing on what that item is about? Mayor, I win the pool. I had thought that both of these items would be asked about today. <laughs> um, okay. Who's going to ha handle that? Jesse, are you going to handle that? Thank you. Are you bugging my office, <laughs> Bob? <laughs> Good morning, Welcome. Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, yeah, we are requesting a uh, budget adjustment of $450,000. Um, and as you said, I, th I think the reasons are positive. It's, it's kind of to, to make money, you need to spend money. Um, and as our revenue through um, October is about $800,000 over budget. So the revenue is, is increasing. Um, and then to do that, we have to meet, um, you know, the, have to provide the products and the services so the expenses are up. Jesse, can you talk about number of rounds? Yes. Yeah, the uh, number of rounds uh, through October where total is 162,956. So uh, nearly 163 rounds. That's up 5,000 rounds over last year, which uh, we all know last year was extremely busy as well. Um, so in, to increase the number of rounds by 5,000 rounds uh, through the first 10 months of the year is, is Great, and we're extremely happy about that. And this also, um, this adjustment would give us flexibility um, to uh, a lot of the things because of uh, supply chain issues we need to order now because they are six, eight months out, um, and that's things that are gonna be vital to our operation, so we need to make sure we have the ability to secure those items now um, so we have a, another successful season next year. Excellent questions. So I, I thought at the last quarterly report, staff had the data that showed we had a 2% increase in rounds. Is that 5,000 rounds? Is a 2% increase? It's almost 5%. There's been an increase since that time. Since right? that time, we've since had this much more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we did, <coughs> yeah. um, I'm sorry, we did, uh, in, just in October alone, we did over 1,000 more rounds than we did last October. Coincides with you starting, is that right? Absolutely. <laughs> it's the only explanation. Um, and then just a quick follow-up. You said about 800000 more in revenue, mm -hmm. so, and that's gross receipts. And we have about 450000 in expense, so the net profit's a pretty good return there. So Right, and, and I believe there is um, some cushion built into that as well, just to allow that flexibility. Sure. So hopefully uh, I don't see us needing every bit of that, but it's there just in case. All right. Thank you. If you want, um, Elizabeth Goulter is here too. We, we have, have a target uh, for our fund balance that we want to carry. And I, I think it's a little over a million if I remember That's correctly. Correct. Is that right, Jesse? And uh, this will allow us to do that. And it did also allow us to schedule some public improvements or capital improvements at the courses, if you remember. So, I think it's wonderful. It seems like we've been able to stabilize uh, uh, the golf uh, fund, but also uh, add back to our golf courses to, to improve the experience. So I just wanted to highlight that and, and thank you for, for your report. And it's great to hear the continued success uh, under your watch uh, with our golf courses. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Is there anything else anyone is interested in talking about on a consent agenda? And if not, then I'll make a motion to accept SAS recommended action with the consent agenda and to accept it as printed. Is there a second? Second. A uh, motion was made and then seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. All in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, the same. Aye. All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do have it. Madam Clerk. Board of Bids and Contracts dated November 21st, 2022. Good morning, Mayor and City Council. Josh Lauber, Department of Finance. <clears throat> the Board of Bids for November 21st, 2022 are as follows. For engineering, we have the WVLFPP Levies KNL Tow Drain Install Phase 2 for Apex Excavating LLC in the amount of $434,795. We have the Northeast Riverside Water Main Replacement Phase 1 for Mies Construction Incorporated in the amount of $1,834,588.
We have the 2023 OP3 CIP microsurfacing and street repair for Vance Brothers Incorporated for $2,350,000 uh, awarded up to the engineer's estimate. We have the 2023 utility cut repair of streets, driveways, and sidewalks for PPJ Construction Incorporated for $2,672,450 awarded up to the engineer's estimate. We have the 2023 Pavement Preservation Program Preservative Seal for Pro Seal Incorporated for $870,000, awarded up to the engineer's estimate. For our trash carts and collection services, we're deferring that to December 6th. Concrete requirements, we're deferring that to December 6th. Structural firefighting coats and pants for Municipal Emergency Services Incorporated in the amount of $194,729. Tree and stump removal deferred to December 6th. Pebble Quick Lime Bulk Delivery for U.S. Lime Company St. Clair for $257.55 per ton. We have the American Rescue Plan Act Grant Management Services for Widow Bryan's LLC for a year one not to exceed $497,830 for a grand total of years two through five included of $900,000. We have the Axon Child Advocacy Center interview rooms audio video for Axon Enterprise Incorporated for $178,258.10. We have the Pierce Velocity Pumper Trucks for Conrad Fire Equipment in the amount of $1,004,345.81. We have the Mantis 4142 Boom Axe Mower for Alamo Industrial for $270,241.41. We have the repair pump, motor, burry depth, baker, pitless for South Lake Sports Complex for Harpwell and Pump Service Incorporated in the amount of $67,600. And we have phase one environmental site assessment for Spectrum Environmental Incorporated in the amount of $65,650. This is how to become a vendor with the city of Wichita. These are open, current open requests for proposals out on the street. And I recommend to approve the bid words as recommended. Questions for staff? See none. Uh, if there's no discussion on this item, then I will make the motion to accept staff's recommended action to receive and file the report, approve the contracts, and authorize necessary signatures. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by, by Vice Mayor Tuttle. Clerk will not open the roll. <laughs> Members uh, in favor of said motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. The ayes do have it. Madam Clerk. Council member appointments and comments. Rolling into appointments, I have a few on my list. Uh, so I'd like to appoint uh, the following two people to the Diversity, Inclusion, and Civil Rights Advisory Board. Uh, that would be uh, Veronica Galetti and Rob Ingen. Also, I would like to appoint to the Tourism Business Improvement District, Chris Johnson and Angie Prather. And I'd like to reappoint uh, Michelle Stein, Scott Ragatz, um, Jim Faith, uh, Nichols uh, Yoal, and Jennifer Finley. There are further appointments. If there's no I'd further. I'd like to appoint Chris Baricio to the Food and Farm Council, Christopher Paricio. Christopher Paricio to the Food and Farm Council as the appointment made on behalf of Councilmember Bluba. Is there further appointments? If there's no further appointments, then I'll make a motion to accept all appointments. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been seconded by Vice Mayor Tuttle. All in favor of said <coughs> motion, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed, aye. same sign. The ayes have it, the ayes do have it. Those appointments have been made. On now to comments for the good of the body. Is there any comments at this time? Yeah, I want to start at NLC. The city of Wichita received ninth place in the digital survey, beating out Tulsa. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the award I accepted on behalf of the city. I will give this over to our IT team, but we did win that for cities between the population of 250,000 to 499 and 999,000. So that was a cool experience. So and we're a top great. 10 city for- We are a top 10 city. And next year we will 
jump into the top five, hopefully. Um, and then other than that, I just had a request. I've already talked to the manager about this. Um, looking at our EBE, DBE numbers, um, the report I saw, which was really great, I wanted to know if we could get that breakdown, broken down a little bit more into how many women-owned businesses only and then how many minority-owned businesses only and the types of work performed. Further comments? Councilmember Fry. Thank you. Um, just a couple of quick park announcements. Um, today, uh, the pedestrian bridge at Swanson Park, which has been closed for a long time, is getting uh, installed. So that's good news. It had been delayed because of supply chain issues, but um, that was a project that was partially funded by an anonymous donor, as well as Wichita Park Foundation and, of course, City CIP. But it's a well used. Uh, path park and have that bridge back in place is great news and then also another park announcement uh, city of wichita received a grant from the national park service uh, land and water conservation uh, fund for two hundred fifty thousand dollars at proct wetlands uh, to install a nature playground and open air shelter this is our first grant that we received for proct wetlands um, so it's a great addition i'll add to that uh, facility so good news Good news. Further comments? Just want to thank the council uh, again for, uh, and thank Brooke, our fellow, for her work when it comes to the overnaming of um, Pastor Montgomery. Uh, there was a, a ceremony following church service this past Sunday, and uh, it was not only well attended, but you could really uh, see the impact that that um, overnaming had uh, in a positive way on the community. So I do just want to uh, thank the council again for their work. Uh, and, and thank uh, Brooke for her work uh, in uh, getting, getting that done. It uh, definitely has a positive impact. Further announcements? See none. With that, I'll make the motion that we adjourn so we can jump into our workshop. Second. Motion has been made in the second. <coughs> All in favor of said motion to adjourn, please respond by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Same aye. side. The ayes have it. The ayes do have it. We are adjourned. Uh, City Manager, the floor is yours for the workshop. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. We've got uh, three items for you uh, today. The first item um, is actually uh, an effort that started over a year ago as there was a growing concern with uh, our violent crime numbers. Um, not, and of course, we're not isolated. Um, the, this issue is present in many other cities around the country, large cities. And we were looking for unique ways to try to address um, uh, these, uh, this growing concern, and we found a model that was working in some other cities called the Violence Interrupter Program. And in fact, uh, at National League of Cities, I attended a session where the city of Baltimore talked about the success they've had with the rollout of the program. So we want to bring you up to speed with the planning effort that um, we've undertaken uh, to this point and to give you an idea of where, where we're headed with the program going forward. Also, I did want to remind you that this is a program funded through ARPA uh, over the three-year period. So with that, um, who am I handing off to? I believe we have a remote presentation. Welcome. Uh, good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, thank yes. you. Okay, great. Um, so my name is Brent Decker and I'm the Chief Program Officer here at Cure Violence Global. And with me I have uh, Kobe Williams, uh, who's the National Director uh, of Programs. And so what we wanted to do today, we have a, a presentation, a brief presentation, where we want to talk about kind of the ideas behind Cure Violence, um, what the model or the program looks like, and then the results that we've seen uh, in other cities, and then just provide a kind of a quick update where we are uh, working in the city of, of Wichita, if that is um, okay with everybody. So I'm just gonna share my PowerPoint slide real quick. Hopefully we can see it. All right, great. Can everyone see it okay? Yes. So, um, Cure Violence Global, we were founded by a physician, by an epidemiologist who worked at the World Health Organization for many years and came back uh, to the United States in the mid to late 90s. And so, the idea of 
violence being a public health issue actually dates back to the 70s, um, where, where a lot of doctors were thinking about how can the public health world contribute uh, to violence prevention. And as doctors and as ERs started getting filled up and as folks really started thinking about it um, as a, a public health issue, our founder really thought about how do we take what we know about epidemic control and apply it to violence to be helpful to a broader strategy um, uh, to reduce violence. And in many cities, unfortunately, and in many communities, homicide's actually the leading cause of death for a certain age range. And so we see this pretty commonly across the country. Um, and so what, what, what our founder and a number of other doctors really started to understand about 20 years ago, that violence does in fact behave like a contagious disease, like an epidemic. And if we treat it as such, we can actually get results um, at a community level. And so the first thing when we think about violence as a contagion, um, and this is something that's really been established now by the CDC, by the World Health Organization, by the Institute of Medicine, um, Association of Public Health, that you know it really fits the mil uh, medical definition of it as well. And so that there is a clustering effect, there's epidemic waves, there's a mode of transmission and there's population characteristics. And so when we think about clustering, um, that violence um, in many cities and, and actually in all cases, it has this clustering effect where it's not uniformly spread across the city or a county, but it has kind of these clusters. And this is the same for cholera. This is the same for HIV. This is the same for basically all epidemics and violence acts in the same way. It has, it follows very similar patterns or epidemic waves as other um, infectious processes like the flu, et cetera. And the main thing though to understand is that that violence is transmitted, right? That it comes through exposure, modeling, social learning. If we see in the next slide, um, in, a, in a public health understanding of it, it's really once an individual has been, observes violence, witnesses violence, experiences trauma, it kind of fundamentally changes the way that they interact with the world and make decisions about um, being violent or not. And, you know, when we think about violence as a behavior, like I said, it's it becomes formed through um, modeling, trial and, error and trial and error. And once it's formed, it gets maintained through culture and social norms. And so you see in this picture right here, uh, you see a kid kind of clasping his hands behind the adults in the neighborhood. This is largely an unconscious process, right? It's a cute picture. Here are kids uh, the exact same age uh, doing the exact same thing, copying um, what they're exposed to, right? And what we see in the case of violence is there's unfortunately many methods of exposure to violence. So you have community violence, media violence, family violence, violence in school, sometimes state sanctioned violence, and all of these things when, when an individual is exposed, not everybody, but sometimes then become more susceptible and they then create, perpetuate violence. And what we see in areas where there's high you know, levels of violence, there's kind of multiple exposures that lead to multiple events, that lead to multiple exposures. And we get kind of where we are in many communities across the United States and world where there's kind of this uh, epidemic clustering of violence. All of this takes place when we think about public health um, with the social determinants of health. We're not really going to go too much into that, but just to note that, you know, in, in public health, how we understand um, how health operates, that there are many other systems in play. It's not just individual decisions um, that really create context where epidemics and unhealthy behaviors as well, unhealthy outcomes kind of flourish. The good news and all of this in terms of health being, you know, violence being understood as, stood as an epidemic is that we know how to stop epidemics. Not that it's easy, not that it's not complicated, but there's basically three things we do in stopping any epidemic. The first is interrupt the transmission. That's where this term of, it, of the violence interrupter came from. The second is we prevent future spread. And the third is we work to, to change group and community norms. And so for the first part of the model, the interrupt the transmission, I'm going to hand this off to Kobe just to briefly describe what that process is and who those workers are. Kobe, if you could take it away for one second. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so good, good afternoon. I mean, what's that morning? Good morning, everybody. 
So what we do, um, interrupt the transmission. That's what we do every day. I, I started off as a violence interrupter, and it was my job to be out there every day to mediate conflicts, build build relationships in the communities and interrupt that transmission. So when I say interrupt the transmission, I'm being out there every day, got relationships in the communities, they know the groups and the cliques in the community and meet people where they are, not judging them. But when I keep my ear to the street, I know what's going on in the target area that we work in. Cause I'm born and raised on the south side of Chicago in a community called Inglewood. And I have relationships there. That's why I was hired to do this work. So I'm able to interrupt that transmission right then when I hear who beefing with each other, who got a problem with each other and everything. So it's all about being out there every day, keeping your ears to the street and know, know what's going on and know who are the major players out there, who are the people out there who making them bad decisions in them communities. You can go to the next one, please. So when we talk about prevent for future spread, so we all focus about changing mindsets, changing <clears throat> behaviors and all that. So what we do is we as good at providing new information, new skills. We um educating them about <clears throat> violence is not acceptable and all that. So that's come with changing mindsets. So we got a couple categories of workers. We got violence interrupters and we got outreach workers. So outreach worker carry a caseload of 15 or 20 participants and they help people what they want help in. Angles management, they want to get back in school, they want a job, whatever they want help in. That's what the outreach workers do. So we focus on changing mindset and changing behavior. <clears throat> you get the next one. So when we talk about changing the norms, we talk about changing the community as a whole. We want everybody to come out, everybody to make some noise. Violence is not normal. So anytime somebody gets shot <clears throat> or killed, we come out within 48 hours a lot of times to do a shooting response. We want to let people know it's not acceptable. So we want the community, we want the grandmamas, the grandfather, the brothers, the sisters, everybody, because we want to change the community norms as a whole. Great, thanks, Kobe. I can, I can take off from here. And so essentially those are the three main parts of the model. Uh, the way that it operates is really kind of having these critical aspects of it. And so the first is the model is implemented in areas where violence is most acute. And so in the process of, of the city of Wichita is really thinking, looking at the data to figure out where are the hotspots, and this is where the, the model is most appropriately to be implemented. The second is who we work with. And so this program is really designed to work with and support the highest risk. And when we say the highest risk, we're talking about those that are involved in shootings today, tomorrow, next week, next month. Those have kind of acute exposure to be involved in violence. And so the reason that we do this is this is often um, a population that is underserved um, and and are, are not, you know, they're the ones that have been kind of kicked out of the schools are not in some of the after school programs are not in stuff. And so this where this model fits into a broader city strategy is really focusing in on working at the highest risk for those to be both victims and perpetrators of violence. And so you can see on the screen, it's really about exposure, being involved in high risk street activity, access to weapons. There's a certain age range, but that's really the focus of of this intervention. The other thing that, that Kobe mentioned, I'll ask him just to talk maybe briefly about it again is the way that we operate, the way that this model is implemented, the same way with any other kind of community health program is the workers have to have a high level of credibility with who we're trying to work with. And so we're, who we're trying to work with is the highest risk. And so our workers have to have credibility with them. So Kobe, I don't know if you wanted to just add anything on that briefly. Right. So yes, yeah, so credibility is everything. You know, most of us came from that lifestyle, but I ain't saying we the only one could do this work. It's all about credibility and relationships. And you got to have a good name in the community where people respect you and would listen to you. So my number one thing is relationships. If I had the relationships in my community, I wouldn't be able to stop with shooting or killing, no so ever. But once we have that relationships and I've been down that walk before, it does help out. But we want to still make sure the people we hand doing this work, they ain't got one foot in and one foot out. We want to make sure they are, they understand that we ain't we ain't still about that lifestyle, but they still got that respect in the community. So credibility, streetwise, 
connected through the community and all that suitable empathy, you know, you want to make sure that all responsibility, that's what we do our, every day. We identify and detect, we interrupt the violence, and we focus on changing mindsets and behavior. We want people to know just because you have a disagreement, we ain't got to shoot and kill each other. But it's important to meet people where they are without judging them. Meet them where they are, build that great relationship, and they'll trust in you and you can really see a change in them. Guess what? Before I even joined, I've been doing this work now close to 20 years. At the time, we are siege fighting. We cure violence global now. I was a high-risk participant on somebody's caseload. I ain't get it then, but now I see, though. It's about really giving back and um, changing and helping these brothers and sisters change and make change in their life. Thank you. Um, the other element of the model and the way that we operate um, is Cure Violence doesn't go open up offices anywhere. So we're working with the city of Wichita to kind of design this and have it be implemented locally. And so what typically happens is the day the implementation of the program although there is typically government oversight either through a health department or a city manager's office the operations um go are done by a existing community-based partner that has a mission consistent with cure violence that it has strong ties to the community uh, has linkage supportive services but this is again a critical aspect it's about building local capacity to serve as the implementer of this the other thing that that we use um, in addition to help with some of the norm change is having public education campaigns about violence and violence prevention and all this gets kind of worked out as the model gets implemented but it's you know uh, there's a whole process for kind of health communications uh, that we use that helps with that and then the last critical element of the model is, is the community involvement like um, mr williams mentioned um, we do a lot of work with the highest risk, but then also, you know, involving the whole community in terms of really shifting some of the peer expectation and norms around the acceptability of using violence and really making a big deal about uh, when violence does occur. Because unfortunately, in many areas where we have acute levels of violence, it becomes normalized. It's like, it's no big deal, right? People aren't even ducking when they're hearing gunshots. We really want to kind of shift some of these norms uh, around violence and make a big deal about it. Um, in terms of where we work, uh, these are all the cities that we're, we're working in. There's actually a few more that need to be added on the West Coast, Portland and Gresham and a couple places in California. But just to give you a sense of kind of the scope of all the jurisdictions we work with, these are the countries that we are working in or have worked in. Um, and again, in every city, in every jurisdiction, in every country, there's a process of what which we're starting right now in Wichita is of taking the approach, taking the model and, and adapting it, what makes the most sense um, locally in terms of how, how does it get kind of lived in. Um, but it's always doing those same three things. The reason um, that you all even heard about us is that there's been a number of independent evaluations on this approach and how it can be helpful. And I, I, I always say this when we're giving the presentation, we are not like the solution, right? This is a, a specific program that is we really think of it as part of a broader strategy and it has kind of a specific lane of really working with those who are at highest risk but what we've been able to demonstrate is by doing this um, we are able to actually see community level impact and so some of the first research that was done on this program was done on the project in in chicago and what we were able to see is this reduction of hot spots and so you can kind of see on the left hand of the side of the screen to the right hand this like cooling down effect and what this has demonstrated, you know, in a lot of the areas we were working, here's another neighborhood, Inglewood, um, that Kobe was just talking about, is when you work with the highest risk in the areas where they live or hang out in, it doesn't just try and spread it to other places. It's, it really has a cooling down effect. Because if we're working with folks where they're at, at the times they're there, in a non-judgmental way, really trying to change some of the behavior and mediate stuff, you have an overall cooling effect. And some of the other things they were able to see in Chicago, you know, shootings going down, hotspots going down, but this idea of retaliation, being able to really help um, reduce retali re retaliatory homicides, right? And so this is a key thing that we're able to be helpful with. The next evaluation was done by John Hopkins in Baltimore. And again, what we saw are, we're able to see reductions, you know, between 30 and 45% or so. Some of the sites in Baltimore have gone multiple years 
without a homicide um, that, you know, before the intervention that would, is, was unthinkable, quite frankly. Um, some of the other places that studies have been done by John Jay in, in New York, and again, what we're able to see in the areas that implemented this approach, they were able to see reductions in shootings, shooting victimization, and they generally fared uh, statistically significantly better than areas that didn't have the approach, right? And so you can kind of see on this, the areas that had the program uh, had better impact in terms of reducing um, shootings and killings in, in their areas. Um, some of the evaluations done by Arizona State University in Trinidad, um, again, showed in a very different context, we were able to do the same thing. We were able to, to see, you know, reduction in, in, in major violent events, as well as reduce some of the level, some of the hospital ad, uh, admissions. On this next slide, you can kind of see it a little bit better, but it's really about, you know, we're kind of this ebb and flow before the program started. And once the program started and really engaged those that were most closely uh, associated with violence, they're able to see kind of a, a, a very significant reduction um, in violent events in the area. Again, in Cali, Colombia, um, this is this was some this was a study done by the Inter-American Development Bank by a local Colombian university. But what we were able to see in Cali, which at the time was the most violent city in Colombia, um, these are two of the most violent um, neighborhoods in Cali. Reductions in homicides and reductions in um, in retaliatory homicides. And you know, for both New York and Colombia based on some of the evaluation reports, the city really adopted it as a citywide program and have invested uh, significantly in doing it like as part of not the only thing, but as part of a city's response to kind of um, acute levels of violence. Um, you know, it's been featured in places like the New York Times and other magazines that kind of showed when community groups are able to do this, they can go, you know, a year without a homicide or a shooting. Um, and again, this is a, a central part of that. It's been featured in, you know, books. Right here is the the, the Institute of Medicine's uh, Contagion and Violence um, summary report, and this is available online that goes into some of the kind of scientific understanding of the contagious nature of violence. There was a film that premiered on Frontline uh, back in 2012 or 13 called The Interrupters that kind of, you know, some of you might have seen it that really kind of details the work Kobe was featured in that film as well. And so that's just a very um, brief uh, review of, of the, the idea behind the program, some of the critical elements, and um, some of the results we've seen. In terms of where we are with Wichita right now, I'm working with Assistant City Manager Martin and others, we're really, you know, been getting, gathering some of the data from the police department, doing some analysis of thinking through like where would those hot spots be? And then based on that, having some additional meetings to figure out um, what potential partnerships could look like and and how the implementation would be. And so we're, you know, we're, 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 we're started, uh, no final decisions about anything that has been made or anything like that, but we're, we're kind of gearing up to have, to figure out how to best position this as part of, you know, the broader strategy. Um, and, we're, and we'd be happy to come back at the future date or time, you know, to provide updates to other meetings and stuff. So I don't know if um, City Manager Martin had anything uh, he would like to add to anything we said about this. Thank you, Brent. I don't have anything to add. I appreciate the detailed presentation you provided. I would like to thank uh, Denise Peters, Brooke uh, Kalchak, and as well as WPD uh, for their involvement in the program. Um, as we've discussed, WPD has a number of programs that are currently uh, operational that will complement the work that CBG uh, intends to do in Wichita. So it truly is a par partnership collaboration along with Wichita State. So thank you, Brent. Appreciate the work you're doing. So I did wanted to add, first of all, thank you gentlemen for being on and, and for uh, giving us an update on this important program. I do want to add for the, the good of the body, uh, I had a meeting with Dr. Han, uh, who is the trauma director and community outreach director for Ascension. Uh, this is uh, one of the, the folks who uh, actually has those hands-on experience uh, working with people who have been victims of, of violence. Uh, and they met recently with, with, uh, with myself uh, to talk about ways of partnering uh, with the community and with, the, and with uh, 
pro programs such as this. I'm not sure if they're aware of this program when we first started uh, our conversation, but uh, they believe that uh, interrupting violence up front is going to uh, also uh, have a positive impact on our uh, healthcare in our community, uh, where we will have uh, less, uh, hopefully, less trauma uh, situations where po people coming into the uh, hospital who, who need those services. So they want to be a part of the solution. So I did want to just again. Uh, say it's Dr. Han, uh, and he works with the uh, Ascension, and they might be able to bring um, some either resources or advice or, or other uh, benefits uh, to the table. And they were very excited to hear that we were going uh, down this path uh, of trying to find better ways to uh, prevent violence uh, before it escalates. So uh, do uh, hopefully the manager can, can reach out uh, and we can uh, try to solidify uh, relationships with people who want to come to the table to help us with a shared goal. Further discussion? Yeah, I had uh, two questions. I also want to say thank you all for the presentation today, specifically around community involvement. What does the support system that's worked for you all look like? So is there a, a pipeline? Let's say you, you stop the transmission of violence and as you build those relationships and you begin to talk about other opportunities, um, do you have that pipeline to like a technical college or other programs that are there that now we've got this young man or woman interested in doing better for themselves? Yeah, I mean, so that, that would be part of us really working together with the city to see what are the resources that are available and establishing those kind of sometimes almost fast tracking um, arrangements especially when we have uh, you know a young person that's ready to kind of do something different but I, I will say the way we think about it is our first and foremost is really trying to first um, change some of the thinking and behaviors around violence and then help with whatever they want help with you know and so we're not necessarily like a jobs program or, or an education program but yeah the linkages are of crucial uh, importance particularly once we've kind of established a relationship and been able to work with that individual to help them kind of make those decisions of wanting to take healthier behavior. So yeah, it's, it's a critical aspect of it and it will be a, a big part of how this can be successful. Because the other thing that we see too is there's sometimes a lot of resources that are available that sometimes folks don't know about or don't see in their own interest. And, don't, you know, and so we're able to kind of, when you have these kind of community-based workers really bridge that gap. And so it kind of helps both ways. Awesome. Uh, second question is probably more for Kobe. Um, for the violence interrupters, is there a uh, mental health support for this? I know that's some tough work. I, I used to work in juvenile justice and three of the young people that didn't listen to me are now in prison. And every time one of them went, you know, that hurt and did something to me. So is that a part of this as well, supporting those, the, the folks out <coughs> on the ground? Y yes, definitely. Um <clears throat> need that additional support, yes, because you're dealing with so many different situations, so many, um, so much violence coming, you know, in these communities coming that way, and you got to be the one to interrupt that transmission. So definitely, um, we do a lot of, um, you know, additional um, self care for ourselves and all that. Because I remember, um, it's a couple of times when this shooting and killing started, you don't get no sleep because you're trying to resolve these situations. So it's like you being on the call 24 seven and all that. So you definitely got to get extra support a lot of times. So you'll get burnt out fast when you're really doing this work. Thank you. I just want to also just inquire, uh, I had a um, member of the community who runs a, uh, a pretty much a wrestling program who heard about this program and wants to know how can his program uh, uh, perhaps get involved. I told him we're more in the, the planning phase at this point, but I think that we're going to have uh, folks who, who are already doing the work uh, to help take kids who might not be presented with, with opportunities and to present them with those opportunities so that they have uh, hopefully more choices. Uh, so as we progress forward, I, I would love to uh, have a conversation about how maybe a boxing club, um, you know, some type of art program, what, what is happening in the community already that we could possibly connect, uh, particularly with young people who are looking for an outlet that's more positive. Dante. Yeah, that, that, would, that would be great. If I could, Brent. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Brent mentioned some of the preliminary data analysis that um, Cure Violence has done uh, based on data that PD has provided. Our next step as far as a process is to do a stakeholder analysis to identify those community-based organizations that we may be able to bring to the table and collaborate in partnership. And so I appreciate your thoughts and your comments. And I believe uh, Denise has scheduled a meeting to occur after the holidays where we'll begin that, that stakeholder identification and analysis. Working in close partnership with uh, Councilmember Ho Heisel and Johnson have been uh, at the table since the beginning. Wonderful, and I would just like to get an update with that. I have full confidence in my colleagues, so I don't have to be at that table, uh, but uh, love to stay in a loop with that as I, I think there's uh, some, some real opportunities to, to um, hopefully, I think the uh, RFP process might be intimidating for some, so there might be some opportunities to, to create a pathway so that folks uh, can sign up and, and uh, we can have more of a fast track for some of these other <coughs> programs that are already out there. Sure. Just to clarify, the reason that uh, Council Member Johnson and Council Member Holheisler are involved in this process is that the two areas that have been identified are located in their council districts. And so uh, we'll, we'll need their guidance and, and input as we go forward. Absolutely. And if anybody here on council or anybody has any suggestions as far as uh, groups that would it be appropriate for them to join in with us, uh, please send them our way. Further discussion? All right. Brent, Kobe, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for being here. Great. We'll see you all soon. Thank you. All right. The second item has to do with an update on a report that we gave you previously about uh, a number of social justice initiatives that had started in the police department as well as in municipal court. We've already updated you on um, the steps that, that are being taken in municipal court uh, to deal with uh, uh, license suspensions and other uh, what I would call important social justice initiatives in that uh, department. But now we're going to update you on some actions that have been taken by the police department over the last several months. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, D.C. Pinkston. Uh, thank you, Mr. Manager. Mayor, Council Members, thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Uh, I don't know if uh, you'll recollect or not, but we had gone through this with you uh, approximately a year and a half ago. It was July of last year. We'd given you an update and we hadn't given you one recently, so the manager asked for an update. So as we're going through this, uh, if you have questions or comments, please let me know. I have a tendency sometimes to speak fast. Uh, I will try not to. I have a tendency to speak loud, and as you can tell uh, I'm trying to stay away from the mic a little bit but I'm still quite loud as it is so um, uh, the Wichita Police Department works in partnership with the community to deliver exceptional services with professionalism and fairness over the past several years WPD's implemented programs and strategies that align with national best practices and revised policies policies to address our community concerns some of those are uh, like uh, de-escalation uh, duty to intervene, uh, crisis intervention training, things of that nature. And we do want to uh, improve behavioral health responses as well. And uh, to that end, uh, the Wichita Police Department views mental health as a priority, has pursued collaborative partnerships and initiated strategies to address emergency calls related to behavioral health issues. I know that uh, the, uh, the community, the statewide community, does not have a lot of resources for mental health. A lot of those resources have been cut out of the state budget. Uh, we are still uh, working locally here to try to work on some of those issues and, and see what we can do. There was a partnership with the housing department, and I believe that, um, Mr. Manager, are they going to do an update on the housing portion? Because I, I kind of touched on it at the last one a year and a half ago, but okay. Uh, I won't talk a whole lot about that. I'm not uh, um, well versed in, in some of the things that they're doing, but a partnership with the housing department and local universities provided officers access to social work interns master's level social work practicum students. That's with Newman University and Wichita State both. It's been a, a very productive partnership that we've had with them. We've added community support specialists and co-responder outreach units that enhance responses to behavioral health calls. You know, we learn as, as, as we go uh, from some of this and, and some of the, um, the methods that we've, that we've employed in the past. Well, clearly we're not productive and we've modified that and I think you've seen uh, uh, improvement of our ser uh, service delivery in that regard and also an, an improvement in our knowledge uh, that all the officers have in regards to mental health. Uh, in addition, crisis intervention training is being expanded to all officers and supervisors. We have recently, within probably the last two months, 
made overtures and taken steps to ensure that we are in charge of our own destiny when it comes to uh, some of the crisis intervention training. We have not had anyone on the police department that's been certified or trained uh, to provide that training to all of the officers. So we're working towards that and uh, I believe within probably the, uh, the first to no later than uh, the second quarter of next year, you're gonna see uh, where we've made substantial progress in regards to that. Is that gonna be um, included at the uh, academy? Uh, yeah, that is uh, actually included at the academy um, for all, all the new recruits but many of the officers on the streets have not been through um, you know, an extended program. We've had uh, minor uh, incursions into it, you know, one hour here training, uh, two hours there for, for those of you, the uh, officers that have been able to get into those courses. The goal is to go to the 40 hour course, which is five days obviously for each and every commissioned officer out there. Okay, thank you. Well, That's what's currently happening at the academy is 40 hours? Yes. Okay. Okay, the uh, HOT team, that's our homeless outreach team, is collaborating with the housing department to connect residents with housing vouchers and case managers. Uh, case managers assist the unhoused residents in housing with basic life skills and addressing behavioral health challenges. Uh, as I think everyone here understands, we do have a uh, substantial uh, number of uh, uh, mental health challenges with people that are, that are uh, unhoused. The case managers uh, um, have been, I think, uh, productive in the regards to turning some of the um, workload over from the officers to them so that they can do the things that they're trained in, in doing and uh, work the contacts that they have as far as that goes. And studies have shown us that if a homeless person is stabilized into housing, it reduces their vacancy arrest by 84%, and that's, that's obviously a good thing as well. Uh, building on the success of our uh, ICT1 team, the community outreach team is a partnership between the city and Sedgwick County that will serve as a mobile crisis response through a joint team as well. The purpose of this team is to provide information and outreach services to those identified by officers as demonstrating a potential need for calm care services. And you know, one of the objectives of that team will be to provide uh, on-site um, service and, and uh, possibly even on-site treatment if, uh, if it's warranted at that moment. Uh, the program will be fully implemented for us next year. For the Child Mental Health Collaboration, the City of Wichita and the KU School of Medicine, which is specifically the School of Psychiatry and Behavioral Health uh, Sciences, will soon launch a Sustainable Child and Adolescent Psychiatry Fellowship Program that will improve mental health care for children and adolescents in Wichita and surrounding counties. At present, there are approximately 60 child psychiatrists in the state that serve the uh, Wichita <coughs> metropolitan area. The partnership will provide WPD with additional clinical resources and shorten the time between initial assessment and access to this continued care. For uh, policy and training, we do have uh, some, uh, some updates uh, for you as well. The police department aims to develop policies and strategies that reflect the community values, reduce crime and improve relationships. We do obviously take feedback from uh, community groups, from um, uh, community uh, parties, uh, even individuals. I've, I've had meetings with individuals that have talked to us about our policies and asked for uh, changes and offered suggestions. So we do that, uh, help create a culture that protects and serves all people. Diversity panels were added to recruit training curriculum and is required by all WPD employees. The uh, recruit officers uh, at the academy are exposed to these panels. Uh, there are four different panels that uh, they're exposed to and uh, this is part of the built-in curriculum for our academy now. Diversity panels foster authentic dialogue between officers and community members. Uh, this is also, uh, um, you know, something that the uh, state of Kansas has implemented uh, statewide as part of their curriculum, uh, which includes problem solving, uh, officer resiliency and decision making. We do want officers to take care of themselves. We heard the uh, prior presentation on the uh, violence interrupters that uh, they do have self care. You know, it is something that's important for them to take care of themselves as well. And we believe it's important for the officers to take care of themselves. Okay, WPD provides bias-based uh, police training annually. Each commissioned officer has to attend that training. Uh, it's an online training. They have to attend it each and every year. They have to uh, take a certification with, uh, within that uh, and, and get a passing grade. So that's an annual training that we have. I believe that started in around 2005. 
Uh, staff is working with the FBI to provide color of law and hate crime training. This is something that's been in the works with us for a significant amount of time. It's, it's trying to get them here and trying to work out getting all of our employees um, able to attend this training because this is a substantial commitment on the part of the city to put everybody through this because we only have three days to get uh, approximately 700 uh, employees through this. So it's going to be substantial to a definite uh, challenge. The courses help dispel misconceptions, facilitate constructive dialogue, and increase cooperation between law enforcement agencies and the communities that they serve. Chief, uh, sir, that training, the FBI training, is going to occur next year. Is that yes? Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe Deputy Chief, uh, Deputy Chief Salcedo may know the, the time frame. What we think it's going to be January. Okay, the police department's making uh, intentional effort to de-escalate crisis situations and encourage collaborative communications. When I spoke to you the last time, I told you one of the major changes uh, in the course of my career was us walking away from people that were in mental health crisis. One of the things that law enforcement, I think, maybe failed for a long, long time in was not realizing that uh, we're going to escalate the situation to the point where uh, force has to be used or even harm comes to that person at our hands. <coughs> So that's been a, a wonderful change uh, in the philosophy of law enforcement across the nation and obviously uh, Wichita adopted that uh, probably five or six years ago at least. And uh, Wichita Police Department is the first police department in the nation to implement evidence-based evidence uh, interviewing curriculum with science-based interviewing training. This was something that Captain Corey had uh, been involved with for a couple of years, was on the forefront of it, brought it forward. I know that some agencies have um, utilize this in, in very small pockets. This is being implemented uh, department-wide and we are the first uh, department in the nation to go uh, department-wide with this training. The training focuses on asking non-judgmental questions that build rapport and reduce risk factors. Uh, and if you uh, talk to Captain Corey, he's quite passionate about this subject, he'll tell you that it is trauma-informed and de-escalation-based as well. Wichita Police Department requires officers to intervene. That is an obligation that they have. I know that w when we say de-escalate, everyone thinks that that's a new term and a new concept. I promise you it's not. I took uh, training my first year in uh, law enforcement in 1988, and we talked about uh, intervening. We talked about uh, calming the situation down. It's just it has a new word, and it has a much more um, defined focus and expectation within the law enforcement community now, and I believe it's accepted uh, within the law enforcement community more so than it was uh, in past generations. All of our recruit officers receive, receive instruction on their obligation to intervene to prevent the use of unreasonable force, and the officers receive duty to intervene instruction during in-service training. So we do continue to cover this. It is policy now, uh, and it is an expectation of uh, all the officers that they uh, comply with that expectation. Okay, Wichita Police Department's entered into an MOU with Juvenile Intake and Assessment Center requiring officers to complete arrest reports prior to releasing youth to JIAC. Uh, this was directly born out of the uh, C.J. Lofton incident, and there are some very specific uh, guidelines and parameters that are within that MOU uh, for us to have to meet. So if anyone uh, has any questions on that, I've got a couple of, uh, of the bullet points on the, the more major issues on it. But I believe that uh, the council may have been provided an advanced copy to, uh, to review. Uh, if not, then uh, I will certainly be willing to provide that to any of you that have not seen that MOU. I know that Council Member Hoheisel asked a question mm -hmm. about a month ago at one of uh, the meetings that we had. Um, you know, where the county does have a lot of um, say in, you know, what uh, their guidelines are going to be when they accept someone into their facility. And so a lot of that's codified into this, uh, this document. And for uh, community relationship building, uh, that's an ongoing continuous process for us that uh, you know, the police department uh, continues to strive. Uh, we use all the help we can get. So if anybody has any ideas or suggestions, please let us know. But a key component of that is successful policing is building the collaborative trusting relationships between officers and the communities that they serve. Uh, to that end, we do expect officers to attend our uh, neighborhood association meetings, uh, I believe they still go to their district advisory board meetings to at least give an update to the district advisory boards. You know, we attend uh, community-based functions. I know that uh, I believe it was uh, 
Juneteenth that I was at that it was uh, over 100 degrees and there were hundreds and hundreds of people that were out there for that event. Uh, brought my grandson and I don't think he was appreciative of the heat, but it was uh, good to have him out there and good to see everybody. So WPD's implemented strategies and programs to assist officers in building relationships while addressing uh, community concerns. You know, we are using uh, bike patrols. We got a, a picture in here to show you uh, some of the uh, results of that. You know, again, we do attend the uh, community events. Recently, uh, all the uh, patrol stations participated in the Halloween event and uh, a really big one uh, for the last couple of years has been the patrol East event called the Candy Crawl that's held at the uh, LW Clap um, properties. Uh, well attended, again, hundreds and hundreds of people were attending this event. Project Safe Neighborhoods is a collaboration between federal, state, local law enforcement, Wichita State University, and all of our neighborhoods here in Wichita. We, uh, we meet with uh, Project Safe Neighborhoods Advisory Board every two weeks, and we do it um, uh, remotely so that uh, they can stay where they're at, we can stay where we are, but we all stay in contact with one another and, and get updates. As part of this grant-funded project, the WPD works closely with uh, community partners to provide support and protective factors to at-risk youth. Some of that would be like our schools, uh, the Rise Up uh, for Youth, the uh, Untamed Athletes, and Project Safe Neighborhoods supports the Juvenile Intervention Unit. The um, uh, Juvenile Intervention Unit is two of our officers that work directly uh, you know, with the at-risk youth. They uh, attempt to intervene. Uh, much like some of the things that you heard from the violence interrupter program, you know, we try to intervene as early as possible, find other uh, methods and avenues for some of the, uh, the people that are at risk, you know, to pursue. Um, I know that uh, we also had a, uh, a violent crime reduction town hall meeting, and I want to say it was in September. I, I can't remember for sure, but I believe it was in September. Uh, it was also uh, pretty well attended, probably 50 or 60 people there. Uh, there was some, uh, some healthy discussion and debate. Uh, um, for those that uh, know Councilmember Johnson, I saw him there and uh, those that were able to watch it on, online. Uh, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, very informative to me as well. And I think a lot of ideas got expressed and, and a lot of information got, got shared around and those are hopefully going to continue. I know before Chief Moore left, uh, he had expressed uh, interest in, in a couple more town halls like that and I think we're gonna continue with those. Uh, our JIU partners, uh, again, with schools, youth organizations, treatment service providers uh, to implement education, prevention, and intervention strategies that reduce incidents of crime among youth. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Rise Up for Youth, Untamed Athletes, the schools, uh, Power Program with Sedgwick County, uh, the Heroes Academy, and Big Brothers and Big Sisters are some of the others that, that we use. Uh, they proactively address at-risk behaviors using established practices such as focused deterrence and restorative justice uh, for these uh, youth. Uh, through a Department of Justice Burn Criminal Justice Innovation Grant, uh, we've collaborated with Newman University and the Housing Department to initiate Project HOPE. And Project HOPE aims to build community trust, reduce the unhoused population, and reduce crime at the same time that we're doing that. Uh, one of the things that we're really proud of was uh, this came from the Patrol West Community Policing Team. They implemented a Second Chance Thursdays to help participants clear warrants without the threat of a arrest. Uh, this has also kind of been uh, at community input and suggestion has been uh, uh, added to to provide information to uh, community members so that they know how to go about getting their licenses reinstated, who to contact, and how to contact them. Uh, the Next Step Alliance provided attendees with information on GEDs, uh, ESL, and adult education programs, and the Kansas International Driver's Ed Espanol assist assisted Spanish speakers with obtaining their driver's licenses. So this has really kind of, uh, kind of morphed into maybe a little bit more than what we had originally envisioned. That's been a great partnership with the uh, municipal court. Um, you know, the municipal court judges, uh, I think we're appreciative of it as well. And hopefully um, the, the councils is as proud of that as the uh, police department is, so. Another, uh, as recommended by the CJ Lofton Task Force, we created a database that fosters transparency and the collaborations that exist between the department and the community. You can find that at the wichitapolice.com. Do not type wichitapolice.gov like I keep doing. It's wichitapolice.com. And as you look, you'll, you'll see the headlines as they scroll through. The one that you want to click on would be the community partners. And you'll see we have over 180 community partners that include neighborhood associations, um, businesses, nonprofits. Um, yeah. Neighborhoods. 
the neighborhood associations, businesses, and the nonprofits. Uh, there's over a, a probably uh, just in the low 180s, but it, it's substantial, and we will update that as we add to that list. For our community relationship building, uh, we want our officers to reflect the community that they serve. We've taken steps to diversify recruiting efforts and attract candidates that may not have considered a career in law enforcement. Uh, as you are well aware, we're competing for um, candidates uh, throughout the entire uh, um, uh, community. You know, the private entity is, is trying to find uh, the best and brightest, just like we're trying to do. I would encourage you, if you know anyone that you think is a good fit for us, to send them our way. Uh, we will gladly uh, vet them, gladly uh, bring them on board. I try to encourage, when I go to squad meetings and talk to the officers, I try to encourage the officers to um, continue to be on the lookout for candidates as well. But, you know, we go to these community meetings, uh, the, the community leaders, and ask them, you know, if they have ideas, candidates, or suggestions, we're hitting up the universities. Um, and again, the, the community leaders, any, anyone that, that has a lead for us, please let us know, because we will gladly look into that. Nobody has any leads for me right now? Okay. Our community relationship building, our recruiting poster images and slogans emphasize our diversity. Uh, the recruiting officers attend cultural events such as the Asian Night Market, Latin Fest, the Asian Festival to attract a diverse applicant pool. Uh, we also attend uh, colleges and universities. I believe we've even went to uh, historically black colleges and universities uh, on occasion to try to recruit uh, from there as well. Has this been ongoing over the last year? Our, our recruiting efforts, Mayor? Yes, and sorry to interrupt, but the, I, I feel like with, with uh, uh, Chief Ramsey, there was a, a big push to have large uh, recruitment classes and particularly to have um, diverse recruitment classes. Right. Uh, over the last year, a lot of the reports we've been hearing, not just from Chief Moore, but with others uh, who have presented in front of the council has been, uh, there's, has not been that there's been a shortage of folks looking to get into policing. And usually there's some hypothesis on why that is, but when you ask further questions, uh, we got into, I think last time Chief Moore was in front of the council, he mentioned that um, it, it's really word of mouth, but in that same presentation, he mentioned the amount of folks who are retiring, which mm -hmm. means if it's word of mouth from police officers and that pool continues to shrink because more people are retiring, uh, then, it, and if that, has been, I guess, the last few months of the recruitment efforts have been mostly word of mouth, asking for leads. Uh, I just want to know, are, are we still having that, um, uh, that real, uh, I, I guess, aggressive is the wrong word, but I'll use it, aggressive uh, going into classrooms, going into communities, uh, and, and actually presenting people with opportunities. Has that been going on as much uh, this year as it has in the past, or is it something that we, as a council, might be able to, to empower folks in WPD to uh, continue? Yeah, absolutely it has. Um, Chief Ramsey, I think, made it a, a point of emphasis. And, you know, nationwide over probably at least the last five years, you've seen a downward trend for applications into uh, law enforcement. Uh, we didn't necessarily reflect that national trend for the most part, but over the past year or so, we, we really have. It has caught up with us where we don't have the level of uh, volume, I should say, of applicants that uh, had been applying. We do have a, a lot more uh, internal turnover. But I think what you're seeing is uh, the city of Wichita probably 20, 21 years ago had implemented a change to their retirement system that was an incentive to keep employees longer. Well, those employees are kind of getting to the, the point in time where they're old enough to draw a check immediately when they walk out the door. Uh, they're uh, finding themselves in position, you know, for other uh, employment opportunities that uh, allow them. Some of them are telling me that they get to work remote. Some of them are telling me, hey, I get an uh, opportunity to try something different. You know, the, the, the life of a law enforcement officer is a grind. There's a lot to it. Uh, there's a lot of focus on it, a lot of uh, uh, scrutiny. And I think many of them are saying, hey, you know, I've, I've been doing this for 20, 25 years now. It, it's time to move on. And so it, it's kind of a culmination of things, but we do have a a substantial decrease in the, the pool of applicants that we've, we've seen in the past. Normally when you get that pool of applicants, is there a time in the year when you know, when you have like an incoming class that you can, you know is, this is going to be the pool for, for, for this session? Is, what time of year is that? Is that in the spring? Is it in the fall? It, it's year round for us. We, we typically, on, on the average year, we do two classes. 
uh, usually one class in basically January and one class basically July. Now those dates may fluctuate just a little bit, but for the most part, that's uh, very close to when it's going to happen. So we're doing recruiting and vetting year round. And this year, do you know, did January's class someone represent past numbers? Because uh, we, we know that it's gone down this year. Uh, is there, a, a, did January represent the year before more or, or at, in January, does that, is that just when it started drop or is it in July? Uh, well, I think that, uh, again, it's, you know, getting through the process to, to be an applicant and get into the police academy uh, is, is very trying. There's a lot to it. You know, you have to have uh, a good background, you know, driving, for instance. If, if you have speeding tickets within the last six months, we're not going to hire you. We want some time to go by before we say, okay, you're, you're going to make it through our process to go further. So typically the people that you see in January were probably about the last six months worth of applicants since the last academy had started. Okay. But I, I just want to know, when did we start seeing the decrease in applicants? Uh, was it in January that you know off the top of your head or July? Uh, pr probably about a year ago, probably January to, to the early part of the year. If, if you need the exact figures, I'm sure I can get a hold of training and find that out for you. But just my ballpark recollection is about a year ago. Okay. Yeah, and I would love to know the amount of recruits we had in, Janu uh, in January and the amount we had in July and compare that for two I'll, years. I will find that out and let you know. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. This is uh, one of the um, uh, pictures that uh, I had a couple. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to throw a funny one in there where an officer's holding a baby that's crying, but I didn't know if everybody would see the humor in it quite the same way I did. But this is one of the things that they do. The, the officer were riding bike patrol in the, uh, the North Bureau. Uh, they uh, were approached by a, a, a lady that provides uh, in-home daycare and asked them to stop and engage with the kids. And this is what you see. This is uh, them stopping and engaging with the children. So it was a good, good positive uh, interaction by the officers, and they're doing exactly what we've asked them to do. Uh, in de December, WPD will kick off the shop with a cop where officers will get partnered with a child and shop with them for Christmas. Uh, we're also doing this in uh, partnership with, uh, I believe, the Police Foundation. We'll have our uh, community policing officers. Uh, the field captains will uh, hopefully be there, or somebody will be there in their, uh, in their place, and we're going to um, participate in this event this year. Uh, WPD for Shelters annually patrol West partners with the Harbor House and Family Crisis to provide Christmas presents to every woman and child in that program. Officers shop through community donations to purchase the items from their, uh, those respective uh, Christmas lists that they provided to us. Uh, we partner with the Wichita Wagon Masters to provide Thanksgiving dinners to families that we've met through the uh, year who need a good meal for the family, and that's a, a collaborative approach as well. It isn't just the Wagon Masters, it's the Honored Versus Foundation, the FOP, the Police Department. And uh, they are, I believe they're actually cooking today. Right and now. I believe that, uh, yeah, and I believe that uh, Chief Sullivan may uh, either have stopped by there or will be stopping by there uh, this morning. I haven't made it by there yet today myself. I was there last year, and uh, they do a phenomenal job. And I don't know if you want to go there because uh, smelling all that uh, turkey being smoked is, it's almost overwhelming, but it's a great, great event. They do a great job, and uh, we're proud to be a part of that. So, do I have any questions? Yes, sir. Um, do you do you have the number, the numbers for um, diversity percentage of African Americans on the force? Um, we have those available. I don't know them off the top of my head, Council Member. Uh, I can get those to you. Uh, one of the things I might have should have mentioned during the presentation was that we have committed to the 30 by 30, and that's a nationwide uh, effort to try to get 30% uh, of our department to be female by the year 2030. So we are working on that. I'll see if I can find uh, that information out for you. Okay, um, and also, do we have any internal mechanisms set up to review policies um, to make things more efficient, to make things uh, more equitable? Um, could you walk me through whatever internal processes we have to sure. to review, like the ordinances or um, policies that WPD has? Yeah, all of our policies have a designated time frame. Many of them are one year. They're reviewed each and every year. Uh, some of them are two years. The less critical policies are probably two years. Uh, but anytime a significant event comes up, that policy is, is reviewed uh, in conjunction with that event. So it's an ongoing process as well. But we probably review three to four policies each and every week. We have an officer, part of our um, information technology 
area that uh, is assigned to keep those going. We try to go through them for grammatical errors. We go through them for updates. Uh, we take, again, we take, you know, community input uh, that we receive, council input, uh, some uh, information or ideas from the manager's office. Uh, law department gets involved and, and reviews policies and makes suggestions to us on what, uh, you know, they like to see and uh, the, the, the process is continuous and ongoing. Okay, so it's more proactive. It's not just reactive to incidents that go on right. in the community. It, it's both. It, it's constant, so it is absolutely proactive, but it is also reactive when the need arises. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. How are we collecting feedback following different community events to ensure that we are building proper relationships? Well, again, I think that uh, we get a lot of feedback from the events that uh, uh, staff attends. You know, the, the field commanders get a lot of uh, instant feedback whenever there's an event that comes up or we get a, uh, let's just say we get a, a warning uh, on a federal level of, of a threat. You know, we try to proactively go out, uh, engage, you know, the, uh, the members or the components of the community that may uh, be targeted by that threat. We get feedback from them in that manner. You know, citizens, uh, I think, feel, uh, at least in, in Wichita, my experience is they feel uh, open to contacting us and giving us feedback about things. We get feedback from emails. We get um, people that call our, uh, our, our, we'll email our input line and say, hey, have you thought about these type of things? When we do our internal component, you know, we search for national best practices to make sure that we're still in compliance. We have access to resources through the International Association of Chiefs of Police on model policies. So we try to get as much feedback as we can. Uh, obviously, uh, the, the mayor and the council are <coughs> policy makers, and a large part of what you say uh, is the uh, direction that, that obviously we look at when, when we're modifying our policies. I'm more interested if you go out to a community event with the anticipation of building relationships, uh, is there a way for the members who attended that event who might have not had direct contact with an officer to come up and say, give a reflection uh, for them to, I, I guess, give feedback on uh, is that, a, was that event successful in actually building community relations or was it just being present at an event? Because being present at an event isn't the same as building relationships. Uh, I know that through your presentation you mentioned there is an ongoing effort to be present in different events, but I'd be willing uh, or interested to know uh, the outcome of those events. Uh, sure. Is there a way to uh, gauge how, um, how, how folks attending, uh, did they feel like they were building a better relationship uh, with our officers uh, at those events? Or did they feel like the events were being policed? Uh, did they have a negative experience? So I, I would uh, be interested to know how, if we can measure uh, some of the feedback uh, so that we can create better, uh, uh, I, I guess, be better uh, um, uh, situations where we are out and about? Well, I, I don't have an exact answer for that. Uh, you know, I know that my experience is I feel like when I go to those events that uh, the community is very receptive. They talk to us, they ask questions, uh, they provide input. I don't know if we've ever tried to, say, gauge, you know, their interpretation of that same event. I know some of the information and feedback that uh, I get from uh, especially the minority communities are they prefer to see us in not necessarily in uniform. I, I think you kind of alluded to that, you know, did they feel they were being policed? I, I think that um, uh, some of the additional uh, information and feedback, you know, that we get is they, they want to see the interaction in their community from the police officers. And again, you know, we put one slide in there, but this is a, a daily occurrence where we're trying to interact with the community, but I don't have a great answer in regards to, uh, you know, have we uh, necessarily assessed, you know, the citizens at those meetings. All I can do is go by anecdotally what they tell me, and I know that uh, I feel good about what they tell me. Uh, Captain Corey, I think, may have uh, something that he'd like to add to this real quick, if you don't mind. I'm uh, Captain Corey. Sorry, pardon the interruption like that. Uh, just button in here. We are currently partnering with Axon on a program called My90. And My90, we're currently in the phase of working with IT to get this implemented. And basically what My90 will do, if I come out and I provide some service on a call or whatnot, uh, they'll select random ones and they'll get a survey. How is the officer? You can provide feedback. It's got an open form to do that. But also, we're going to pair it with our um, MyShare app or PDShare app to where I can have a QR code, and if we're at one of those community events like you described, 
we can just zap it there and you can give us some feedback openly about that event. And that's something that's been in progress for a while and it's, it's a really interesting program and that'll give us the analytics on our side of the fence where we'll be able to see those and see how our officers are doing. That actually sounds great. So it would be a Q code so that people at the event can anonymously uh, uh, give a reflection on, on how they, they feel they, they were treated or how they feel uh, the, the, the event went uh, and that we could use that to build upon uh, our community policing efforts to build relationships. Is that the read? Yeah, I, th I think that's something we can do, especially for specific situations like you're bringing up. Um, so it's got a couple mechanisms. You can approach an officer and they can give you a QR code or we could have a QR code for a community event. Or two, um, it's randomly generated when officers go on a call um, and they'll, they'll send a text message to the participants there. I'd be interested in that because I believe that usually when we do get feedback, uh, it's usually after something negative happens. I would love to get collect feedback e even you know in positive situations and try to see as you're continuously training and updating policy, um, are there variables uh, that uh, certain officers have utilized that have uh, created better <coughs> success with building community relationships? So uh, in a way that we could have hopefully that data uh, available as well. Uh, obviously, we don't need to know who's submitting the data uh, or who, who the officers were, uh, but just uh, just so that the council can also re review and, and perhaps even uh, the community review uh, to to see what you know to to encourage more feedback. Absolutely. Any further questions? <clears throat> yeah, I had a few questions actually. Um, so we talked about CIT training. Do you have the percentage of our force that's trained already? Uh, it's, uh, no, I don't. It's going to be pretty small because, again, the, the CIT training that's been um, uh, implemented and, and utilized has been very few classes. Again, we have not been in charge of our own destiny when it comes to that council member. The, we're stuck with the classes that are provided to us. The CIT training is, is uh, very extensive and intensive because it requires a substantial commitment from community partners to help us with that. The police portion that we train is very small uh, in comparison to the overall 40-hour program. So it's a substantial commitment from community partners to help us with that. Okay. Chief, so um, if, well, if I could, everybody's been through the first aid training, right? That's correct. And then, and, and then we're doing the train the trainer so that we'll have greater uh, ability to get more people through the academy. Okay. Yes. Is that, the, is that the mental health first aid training? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So 100% of our new recruits have that training? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, going to... Um, ICT-1, are, are they dispatched at 911 just yet? Is there a special? ICT-1? Yeah. Yes, they, they are a, uh, an immediate crisis response. The uh, outreach team will be a follow-up team. Okay. And then uh, one of our big pushes, you touched on it a little bit, with partnerships with Newman and WSU with social workers. Do, you, do we know how many social workers we have working with the police department yet? Th that are on the police department? Working with. So one of the goals in 2020 when we looked at trying to build those relationships with the right. universities was integrating them in there do we have a number of graduate students that are working with their or uh, i guess professional social workers i don't have a number for you okay. i apologize you have to add up a few programs it's probably what on day five six right now budget includes nine embedded in the department going in 23. Okay, well, I also know that we were working on, uh, I guess, a special program with WSU. Do we have the outcome of that? Chief Ramsey was working with some of the professors at the university to develop something that was supposed to, okay. I'd love to hear where we are on that. Um, on the diversity panels, I know I've participated in that and our new recruits are there. Do we have something that has our current officers go through those as well? So I think that would be a big help for them to hear from the diversity panels as well. We have in the past, yes. It, um, basically, the opportunity for that would be at our uh, mandatory in-service training, our annual training. And I think we did one either a year ago or two years ago, but I don't think we've done one since. Okay. But we, we do add those in occasionally. Awesome. 
I'll be done shortly. I wrote a lot of notes. <laughs> um, on the bike units, I've, I've really loved seeing those officers out, engaging with people, um, going to the events and stuff like you said. Do you think we will get to a point or are we down too many officers to where we can get even the patrol officers going into local businesses, saying hello, building those types of relationships so it's not just our community police officers and the folks on the bikes? Yeah, I think that's a uh, lofty goal for us. Uh, you know, we've had that in the past. We've had that where uh, patrol officers, I did it as a patrol officer, uh, be able to come in and, and, and take a bike out and, and, and patrol that way. Uh, we're, as you know, we're down quite a few positions right now. And uh, that even includes a couple of community policing positions that have not been filled due to the, the staffing shortages we have even responding to the uh, 911 call. So that is a goal. And I think if we could get ourselves to the point that we were fully staffed uh, and uh, managing our workload a little bit better, we could see that. But, but right now, I, I don't think that we have that luxury available to us. Okay. I do think that that goal, though, is uh, something that's been expressed by Chief Sullivan. And at, at some point, he'll, I think he'll want to address the council. You'll want to talk to him about some of his initiatives. Awesome. Nice to have you. I only have three more things. Um, when we look at the language, and I used to do this because I worked with young people as well, but when we look at the term at risk, oftentimes that starts off a negative view for some of the young people. And a lot of times these are like more opportunity young folks. They have the most opportunity to succeed if they were just helped a little bit. So just want to throw that out there. Um, when we look at recruitment, I know you mentioned going to HBCUs, which is exciting. Um, are we advertising in prominent uh, publications like the Community Voice or any of the Hispanic publications? I believe we have uh, uh, advertised in the Community Voice before. I don't know if we have in the Hispanic uh, language uh, publications. So I would have to look into that and try to get you an answer to let you know if we have or not. I, I know that we that is our, our desire. We do try to uh, uh, reach out to those minority communities as much as we can. Okay. I would like to also add consideration to social media influencers, since a lot of young people are looking at the influencers and not traditional media sources. So in Wichita, we have two people that I know of. Uh, one is the Adrian Harding, who has a million followers on TikTok. And then there's a young lady by the name of Carla De La Torre who has six million followers. So I think conversations with some of the social media influencers could potentially be a, a benefit for us. And then lastly, um, that barbecue we had some years ago was um, really great. And I think the biggest mistake we made was stopping it. And there was many in the community that felt like it was great to have all of that at McAdams, but it seemed to be just a one and done thing, even though the next year there was uh, four, I think, at every bureau, but it wasn't the same type of turnout and attention. Sure. Um, so I would love to see something like that start and continue because it, it offers regular opportunities for that forced interaction, engagement, learning, relationship building, and it's something that people can come to expect is, is coming, and it was a really good uh, opportunity for the community. And just as a shameless plug, that was one of the items that we mentioned to become an all-American city in 2019. Mm -hmm. We actually made national media because of that event. So I concur completely. I think that would be great. I would hope that we would gather feedback to ensure that uh, folks did feel that, that they uh, had a positive experience with that as well. And also, I would be interested to know, in, in your estimate, has as a, you mentioned that it was about a year ago in your estimate that we have seen a, I guess, a tightening of incoming uh, potential officers. Um, has it been within the past year or so where we've seen officers uh, leave the force? Have we seen a bump in that? Is there any uh, indication that it's been more recent that we have less folks? You, you've alluded a couple times that uh, we're not at full staff, that we need to be at full staff, uh, and that people have um, either are either retiring or, or leaving. Uh, so I'm, I'm just interested, that has we, have we seen an increase in percentage uh, over the last year of folks leaving policing? Well, again, Mayor, the, the, the one thing that, that I hope I can in, explain properly to you is the, the nature of a police career. And as you get older in this profession, uh, you know, the, the job becomes a little bit more demanding. It really is a younger person's vocation, especially for the officers on the street. 
And so, you know, maybe with some of the uh, issues nationally that you've seen with the scrutiny that uh, uh, law enforcement is under, you know, they, these officers perceive themselves as I'm doing a great job, I'm working really hard, and I'm not getting the support that I need. So that's, that's factored in. I've had a couple people tell me that. But for the most part, I think it's just it's age and it's time. And then we're not finding replacement people to come in to take that spot uh, like we had uh, maybe had the luxury of in the past. I understand the national climate. I think that Chief Moore has also mentioned a national climate as, as a issue with, with folks who, who are turning towards retirement. I'm interested to know, uh, particularly based on what, what uh, media reports, uh, what, what I've, I've read yesterday uh, in a lawsuit, uh, ha is there, have we seen, uh, because of the text message situation or because of uh, some of the uh, other stuff with the uh, woman who, who was hit uh, on the bottom, um, is that isolated or has that actually led to an exodus of people of color and women uh, from applying to be officers or for leaving the city of Wichita? Uh, so just based on some of the information that we've seen within our own organization that has come out, uh, that, that's really to the root of my question. Usually I'll ask multiple questions to get to that point. I'm just gonna come out and ask, sure. uh, uh, have we seen more women leave in the last year, more people of color leave in the last year who weren't at retirement age? Uh, and just, and I know you might not have that data, you might have to get back to me, uh, but if you do know off the top of your head, I'd be interested. Sure, I definitely don't know off the top of my head. I don't have any information uh, that I could relate to you that would uh, uh, substantiate or refute you know that uh, question that you've asked. Uh, I, I know I'm, I'm just for myself. I know the the few females that have left the department prior to retirement age. You know, one followed her husband to another job. Uh, one, you know, she followed her father into this profession. She left because she got married. Her husband's in the military, and he got stationed somewhere else. So, I guess anecdotally speaking, I don't I don't think I feel like there's been a mass exodus of, of anybody internally based upon that. Uh, and I would have no way to be able to tell you if that's um, uh, been an issue with any of the external applicants. Okay, thank you. I guess my, my final comment would be, I, I think or I wish we could do a better job of communicating all of the changes that we do with the police department Sure. Uh, on a more regular basis. Because the last few years with me being in office, it, it feels like I know all of this good stuff but we don't talk about it unless something bad happens in the community and then it's almost like we're saying, hey, we're not that bad, look at us, but we're not continuously saying all the good stuff. Because if we were, we wouldn't have to say that. People would know that, you know, Wichita really is different. We've done these different things. Maybe we're not perfect, but, you know, it's just more part of the conversation and we are doing good stuff. Yeah, that happens in pretty much all departments too. Yeah. Police is probably most visible but I think it happens up and down the line. Yeah. The city of Wichita does a lot of good and it doesn't always get reported yeah. or shared. Police TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Council Member Johnson. Okay. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> All right. Sorry. I didn't know we'd be going quite this long. Um, we've got one last presentation for you. This was requested by the council. Uh, as you know, we're um, coming down to the end of our grant <coughs> program for facades, and the council had asked for us to bring some information back regarding the success of the facade program and some thoughts on how we should go forward in the future just for your consideration today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Troy Anderson. Honorable Mayor, members of Council, Troy Anderson, Assistant City Manager for Development Services, and uh, I'm going to run through a, a brief presentation, uh, a review of our facade improvement program. A couple of things we're going to try and touch on uh, a little bit. It's just a little bit of the history. How did we get to where we are uh, today? We'll dive into the program a little bit. Uh, talk a little bit about the benefits, some of the success stories, and then some of the issues and concerns that maybe we've identified, which then leads to where do we go from here, um, including perhaps uh, one alternative that uh, we might be recommending going forward. So with that being said, uh, this program was a program that kicked off back in uh, March of 2001. Uh, the Facade Improvement Loan Program was established primarily around 
enhancing visual aesthetics of the downtown area and providing an incentive for small businesses to invest in their present locations. Uh, that's a common theme that we've seen throughout the years as uh, this program evolved in 2003, 2006, 2009. It all comes back to this sort of uh, what I <coughs> might mention as a mission statement uh, of the program. But back in 2001, it also laid out uh, some program goals. Uh, a lot of those, like I said, are focused on uh, visual quality of the core area, the core area, um, and preservation of some of our historical and architecturally significant buildings. So when the program was first introduced, it had uh, two elements, uh, primarily special assessments. Uh, the special assessments were uh, over a period of 15 years. Uh, and then there was an element of a grant uh, or a forgivable loan at that point in time. And so the city initially set aside $350,000 in local funds. Uh, my memory serves me correctly, were, they were community development block grant funds. Um, based on a five-year forgivable loan cycle, uh, the grant was, uh, the grant amount was uh, eligible up to 25% of the total project costs, uh, not to exceed $30,000. So fast forward a couple of years, 2003 comes along, We've seen a couple of projects introduced, and so in 2003, we identify some opportunities to uh, further elaborate and further uh, define the program specifications. So we introduce a high-rise building aspect of the program, uh, defines that as four stories or more. Uh, it's not eligible for grant forgiveness, may include two facades. Um, but primarily there's this introduction of this idea of a significant private investment, meaning that uh, an amount equal to or greater than the amount financed must also be invested into the project. So that'll be a, a theme that we'll hear about here a little bit more in just a second too. So uh, again, in 2006, we somewhat revisit the program. Uh, we expand the program boundaries, uh, provide additional funding, and then we further modify the guidelines. So uh, back in 2001, as you can see here on the screen in front of you, uh, the program was limited to those properties that are along Douglas Street from Seneca to Washington, a uh, very sort of limited scope of, of what we were trying to accomplish in 2001. But in 2006, we expand the program area to include the downtown SMID, Douglas from Washington I-35, I-135, the 21st Street redevelopment area, South Central, Delano, and so on. Uh, as part of that 2006, there was really kind of a concentrated effort around these commercial corridors. That's really kind of what the focus was, was trying to use the facade improvement program to enhance um, the aesthetics and improve uh, the quality of the buildings, facades along these commercial corridors. Uh, also in 2006, uh, we added additional funding. So. Between 2001 and 2006, the city expends virtually all of the original $350,000. Uh, there were 20 projects approved, totaling a little over $3 million in um, specifically facade improvements. Between 2001 and 2006, we didn't really track um, the overall total project. We just focused on tracking those facade improvement <coughs> costs, uh, which will be a key point here I'll make in just a minute uh, about the total investment being made. So between 2001 and 2006, we didn't do a really good job, but after 2006, we do a better job of actually tracking project costs. Um, between that first period, 01 to 06, um, we award over $267,000 in these grants or forgivable loans, leaving the balance of about $82,000, which is why in 2006 there was this idea of adding additional dollars to the program. So there were some savings that were realized from refunded state office building bonds. So that $411,000 was then added to the program. So in 2006, we had roughly $500,000 <coughs> balance moving forward. So in 2006, uh, we also, again, kind of dove into the guidelines, tried to figure out exactly what we were trying to accomplish. Uh, we introduced this idea of permitting a conversion of use on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, so as a, a facade might have just been initially for preservation or, or rehab, uh, expanding the program a little bit to use those facade enhancements on a, a a change of use or a change of occupancy class. Uh, 
We also started identifying uh, projects and differentiating between projects that were mid-block, that only had one facade along uh, a block face versus those corner lots that might have had two. And so we reduced the actual grant or, or loan forgiveness from 15000 to 10000 for those facades. Um, we also then introduced a 2% cost recovery administrative fee. And this is really where we really kind of get into the weeds a little bit, as, as you'll kind of see. We extend significant private investment to high-rise projects. We establish a minimum project size of 50,000. Uh, we introduce the requirement for a financial needs analysis, and we update the list of eligible and ineligible improvements. We also, <clears throat> in 2000, excuse me, in 2009, we also, as a result of a number of projects that were presented between 2006 and 2009, um, there was a, a particular project where there was a change of ownership during the process. So we kind of realized some of those concerns and issues with the program that was originally structured. So we introduced this maximum assessment ordinance approval process at the beginning of the project, knowing that if the property changes hands during the process, we don't have to go back and potentially deny uh, a proposal just because of the ownership change. But with that being said, we also do get into a little bit uh, more vetting of the property owners and their financial situation and so on. Um, we update disbursement <coughs> procedures for AIA pay request forms and uh, allow projects under 500000 to be financed with tax exempt bonds where there's capacity. We also expand uh, the, the term on these specials from 15 to 20 years uh, in, in special circumstances. Uh, we sort of recast this idea of this, uh, that it's a forgivable loan with if it's an actual grant, and that's the term that we kind of use today. Uh, we introduce phasing uh, with a, a construction schedule that's uh, somewhat vetted, uh, require verification of property ownership. Um, we require as is, as built, and again, as I said, background checks. So that's a little bit of the history of kind of how we've arrived to where we are today. So as I've said, the program uh, has a little bit of two concepts, primarily special assessments, and it's based on what I'll call a very liberally construed interpretation of state statute. Uh, so according to Kansas State uh, Annotated Section 126A02J, such worker improvements may include the following without limitation because of the to improve retaining walls and area walls on ways or land abutting thereon. So as you can see, this is a very limited scope of what the project, which is why it's just a facade improvement program at this point in time. Um, but as you'll see here, when we start getting through some of the issues and concerns, it has very limited scope to those facades, those area walls that actually front on a public street. We've ran into a couple of projects within uh, uh, even the last couple of months of uh, a, a property owner uh, coming to the city wanting to participate in the program and because the building was actually set off from uh, the from property line, the, the right of way line by a couple of feet, it really kind of begs the question, does this meet the intent of the statute? So we have some really limitations on the scope and the applicability of the, of the program. <clears throat> um, Additionally, that aspect of the program as it relates to the grant offering, right? So again, in 2001, we had 350,000. In 2006, we had 411. Since 2006, we've had 14 projects, and I, I put an asterisk on that because in the next slide, you'll see there's actually a total of about 22 projects that have gone into and taken advantage of this, but only 14 have taken advantage of that grant aspect, so that's why the numbers you see here are, are limited to just those projects that took advantage of the grant offering. 14 projects totaling $2.5 million. Those were facade costs, but 17.9, almost $18 million in total investment. And we only expended roughly 450,000 in grant dollars to get $18 million of investment within uh, our urban core. So today, which is one of the reasons why we're before you, is we have a remaining budget of a little over $50,000 for the grant program. So this is that uh, breakdown of all the projects that, since 2006. And as you'll see, I don't know my circle's a little off here, but um, over the 22 projects, uh, we've 
expended roughly $350,000 in grant money. Uh, we've received almost $45 million in improved valuation as a result of this program. So just along that rationale, it seems like the program is a, a, a great use of, of um, city investment, city incentives, and, and again, we're seeing uh, a huge investment back in. But it does have its limitations as we're kind of about to see. Jory, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. <clears throat> Pardon me. If you can, can you go back to slide 17? So I'm looking at some of the numbers in 17 and then looking at the chart in 18 and. Yep. I don't, I'm not seeing where they're gelling. So, so tell me if I'm wrong. So, so far we've 14 projects and it's been 2,531,429. So if you go, can you advance to slide 18? So then it says the grand, so what would be? I'm, I'm gonna step away from the mic for just a second. I'll go kind of illustrate. Thank you. So you'll see all of these projects here that didn't take advantage. There's about um, 14, there's about eight of those projects that didn't actually take advantage of the grant offering because they didn't qualify for that grant offering. So the number on the previous slide, these are those 14 projects. The 14 projects that did take advantage of the grant, because we were trying to compare sort of 2006 with 2001, we had 14 projects. The facade improvement costs, the investment in the actual facade was only 2.5 million, but the total project costs for those 14 projects were 17 point, nearly 18 million. If you look at all 22 projects, right, this doesn't include, well, you have the 9.8 of the facades, right? I don't have the number in here for the total program. But what I do show now is I switch from actual project costs to the valuation increase that the investment made. So the next three col col the next two columns, here was the grant offering. Here's what the base value was for those 22 properties. Had a base value of 8.5. We added $44.8 million to that that valuation that now the city is receiving, and, and all of the taxing jurisdictions for that matter are now seeing additional revenue. And it's not a one-to-one. -one. I mean, it's, the value went up greater than the, the investment into sure. the facade because it now improved the entire value of the building. Sure, Correct. Just, just to make sure I understand. Yep. So in slide 17, it said we expended 442,562 in grants. And then in slide 18, it says 300 and 45, 625. So that's because not, that's the where the gaps are, the empty spaces. Correct. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Yep. I just wanted to make sure I, I completely understood. Uh, absolutely. Thank you for, for. Yeah, it's a little, and again, that's why th this program has become, it's a great program. Yeah. I, I really should start off with, it's a great program, right? I mean, we've seen the value increase in the urban core exponentially and all of the community is benefiting that, not only from a ones and zero perspective, right, but look at all the buildings that we have preserved, uh, all of the uh, projects that we have created that has added jobs, um, that has, uh, again, preserved the historical integrity of our downtown, et cetera. This program is a great program for all of us. Oh, yeah, I, absolutely. and I'm not questioning that yep. at all. I drank the Kool-Aid on this a long time ago. I think this yeah. was a catalyst for a lot of the momentum we're seeing absolutely. downtown. I just needed to make sure I understood it. So if I get asked, I can yep. I can give the accurate story. So yep. thank yep. you. Uh, so just broadly, right, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but what are the benefits to the city? Obviously, we get preservation of existing buildings. We get beautification and enhanced aesthetics in downtown along our arterials. We see increased property values. Sometimes we see increased tax revenue. What's the benefit of the program to the owners and the developers? They get low-cost loans. But that's that special assessment aspect. Um, and then there's the element <coughs> of grants to reduce the overall cost. So here's a couple of our success stories. Um, before I dive into the actual success stories, what I wanted to show here was the area you see out there outlined in blue is the project area that it was expanded to in 2006. Interestingly, if you look at all of the properties that have actually taken advantage of the program, uh, it's very limited, particularly to the urban core. And again, the reason why is probably because a lot of the buildings don't front the public way in some of these other areas there right. as the city grew these buildings were set back so even though we expanded the area 
there's limited application because of the, even though it's a liberal, liberally construed interpretation of state statute, it has limited scope because it has to have, be adjacent to the public right of way. But in 2011, we had 104 South Broadway. Uh, the facade loan was for uh, just under $2 million. The base value before the program was 710000 The value after the program, a little over $8 million. 303 South Broadway, 2016. Facade loan, 589000 The base value before project, a little over 100000 After project, nearly $3.8 million. Jeez. And I'll tell you, this project, even before coming to Wichita, this project is recognized across the nation as an adaptive reuse project. Incredible project. This is, should be on every staple of every presentation we ever do. Great project. Um, 1525 East Douglas, uh, facade loan, 500,000. Base value was nine. Improved value, 2.4 million. But it's not even the big projects, it's even the small projects, right? Um, here's a small project, 2014, 623 West Douglas, facade loan of 111,000. The base value is just a little over 100,000. The improved value, almost 400,000. Additionally, though, with this is now you see occupancy, right? You see jobs that are being created. You see uh, commerce and business taking place. Uh, it, not only investment in the building, but maintenance of the building. This, this, another great story, just even on the small scale. Okay, so as we've talked about, what are some of the issues and concerns? Obviously, <laughs> facades must be abutting public ways, limits the scope. Um, also, with this limited scope is other ineligible costs, right? Things like landscaping, non-visible roofing, attached hang and projecting signs, mechanical equipment, parking lots, interior. This is a great program for facades, but somewhat ignores all of the other opportunities that we have, not only within the urban core, but within the boundary of what we've previously described. There are also concerns around the impact that it has on smaller projects, right? Because of the costs associated with application and vetting, because of the costs associated requiring professional design assistance, um, establishing and that justification for a reasonable rate of return, some of these, real, some of these smaller projects um, aren't able to really realize the savings and the investment because it just doesn't make sense for them to kind of go through this for smaller projects. Again, projects less than 50,000 not eligible. Okay, so where do we go from here, right? Uh, part of the big question we started to ask ourselves is what's the cost of benefit comparison? Um, you know, we, we, we have a lot of revenues of a $1,000 application fee, $250 vetting administrative fee, 2% administrative cost recovery fees, et cetera. But on the applicant side, they also have third-party costs that range in the thousands of dollars. Uh, staff time, I've been told that oftentimes even some of the smallest applications will take hours just to process. And, and so the labor associated with some of these um, begins to kind of beg the question, what are we really trying to accomplish? Additionally, as we've looked through all of these projects, uh, our offices have found no substantial correlation between the grant offering and the program participation. Um, so if you go back to the numbers, right, we've expended some four hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars and we've got an increase of forty four million dollars. We didn't receive any information along the way that it suggests, well, because you're offering that upwards of $30,000 grant that it, I'm not going to participate in the program, or it's because of that that I am going to participate in the program. The benefits that we're seeing that are realized by the applicants are coming out of the special assessment aspect of the program and not necessarily the grant offering. Grant offering, for all intents and purposes, is somewhat icing on the cake. It's not the cake. So. So what I hear you saying is, yes. is that we don't know if the programs would have happened if we offered the funding or not. Correct. What, what we're finding is kind of looking back through all the applications and kind of scrutinizing them a little bit. We didn't see any evidence that would suggest that if we hadn't offered the grant that they wouldn't have participated in the program otherwise. Yes. So just, the, just the grant aspect. Just the, the grant aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But an interest. So. 
cart before the horse, but if we continue providing the grant, that might be a question to ask is, you know, how, even on a Likert scale of, you know, one to 10 or something of how likely would you be to participate in this, to, to proceed with this project without this fund? I don't know, I'm just thinking. I mean, there's, if that's a concern and that's something that we want to know to be able to evaluate, monitor, use, um, there's ways that we could certainly do that in applications, right? Yeah. Absolutely, and I'm glad you bring up the question because that's a perfect segue. Into, You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was not queued up, I promise. <laughs> uh, but absolutely, the question is, all right, so either we continue down the road with this program and perhaps we continue to set aside dollars for a grant offering, right? The alternative is we look at a program that expands on the usage and the eligible expenses, so a, a, a business owner, a property owner who's investing in their property can use the program to a large, which then compensates for the lack of a grant offering that may be offered by the city. So that's kind of the direction you go, right? You either continue down the road of, of where we're going, or we look at alternatives that can expand the program and grow the, grow the program and allow property owners and developers and investors to take better advantage of the tool without the city having to, to subsidize some of those costs. So one example might be uh, a community, community improvement district, right? So state statute does permit both the special assessment aspect, which is kind of what we talked about was the success of the program anyway, right? Um, in addition to or either a sales tax. So you don't have to use the sales tax option mm -hmm. as part of a CID. You can just use right. the special assessment aspect of a CID. We have one that does that now, and Correct. that is River Vista. Yep. So. The reason why I bring this up is, again, just an alternative, right? The CID program is not limited to those projects that front or right. are abutting a public way. And the additional uh, elements that you Correct. could add to the landscaping, the parking facade. lots, all four facades, right. mechanical equipment. So now we're talking about real investment back into the property. To, if you go back to the slide that shows the area, right, now we're seeing that a CID program can see all the benefits that we realized with the facade improvement program, but we can see it in more geographical areas and we can see it in a way where we can focus on um, advancing particular uses. I'll get to that in the next slide. And really where you see this in the side-by-side -side comparison is we kind of did that. Here's what the facade program offers on, on the second column there and what a CID program might offer. So if you kind of just walk, walls abutting a sidewalk, are you, that was the intent of facade improvement? Yes, but the CID offers that as well. Walls abutting a parking lot, the current program doesn't include those, mm -hmm. but a CID would. 15-year financing, yes, that's what we originally set out. 20 years in certain cases, CID offers the same. A 22-year, though, is not offered under the current facade program, <laughs> but would be under a CID. And then we go through that laundry list of landscaping, non-visible roofing, parking lots, new construction, expansion, acquisition. So the idea is maybe what if we roll this or reconstitute this program under the umbrella of a CID? And we can perhaps do that in such a way where we're being strategic on using the tool in very specific geographical areas, obviously downtown, but over the last couple of years, we've also identified other areas, right? Those formative areas within the ECA, those nodes that were further identified within that ECA, right? So we, we can take it even beyond that geography that we saw that the facade improved improvement program tried to expand it to, and we can even reach out further using this tool. And we can also restrict it to very specific uses that we want to try and uh, attract or acquire, invest in, in these geographic areas. Things like office, things like housing. And so by growing the tool, growing the program to include other eligible expenses, perhaps not having to 
put grant dollars or city funds into the program and expanding it to other ge geographical areas that we know needs the investment, we know, and, and there are uses within those geographies that we want to try and uh, attract and try to uh, encourage development of. We think this is where this alternative um, might be a good readaptation of the facade improvement program. Yeah, I, I appreciate this uh, creative suggestion as a frequent critic of CID sales tax, right. because that's our ability to levy, levy a sales tax or via referendum um, when, a, when a tenant can just raise their own prices to get that 2%, sure. and they should do that if that's what they want. But seeing the value that the program has worked via special assessment because we're still collecting the, the revenue on that property tax. I appreciate this idea and I think it's a creative solution. Yeah. And we're open to other alternatives. Um, we're open to the idea of just continuing to offer the program, but yeah. um, if we really want to, we think that if we really want to maximize the investment back in our community, this tool, the facade improvement program, has somewhat of a limited scope. Um, yeah. And so we really want to try and retool that a little bit broaden the scope, really focus on expanding the, the use of that tool outside of just the downtown urban core, uh, and then we can see reinvestment in particular projects that might not otherwise mm -hmm. have seen it. I know there was one that was uh, recently inquired on uh, down on Broadway, um, <coughs> so in response to that, as it currently exists, there's only one facade and those expenses associated with that one facade that would be eligible. However, if we introduce sort of this new of all CID program, now I can use expenses associated with the parking lot, the main entrance to the building, et cetera. Now I, I've provided an opportunity for reinvestment in the community at a much, much grander scale. I appreciate that. Um, what areas of town do you, are you guys looking at possibly expanding? The zone two. And that's why I, I'll kind of focus not necessarily on one particular area, but as, as for example, that Places for People has identified these formative areas. So you could say, okay, we're going to encourage the CID um, in formative areas, right? Um, there are, were very specific nodes, intersections within the ECA that were identified. So you could you could identify more, geogra more geography, more geographical area by using some of the areas that have already been studied and identified and just building on the momentum that some of that has already created rather than trying to specifically identify a Delano. Or, we already know those were within the reinvestment areas. <clears throat> How do we get outside of that? Some of the formative and nodes that were identified in that could be a good start. But we're open to ideas. So would it be strictly <clears throat> within the ECA that we'd be looking at projects? Um, it could be a good start rather than kind of allowing the CID to expand out beyond the ECA. Um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're open to ideas. And as we continue to kind of craft what this retool tool might look like, we could entertain that. Um, I think there's been a concentrated effort over the last couple of years to see reinvestment in the ECA. So I think that's where we would primarily start. Uh, but if there is, a, a, if there is a, a reasonable, logical reason to use it outside of that, I wouldn't be opposed to it. I think this is uh, really creative as well. It's good to hear Councilmember Fry say something positive about the CID. <laughs> That was that recorded. Was that, was, <laughs> that was correct. That was recorded, um, right? So my, my question is, is this equitable? So you talked about the smaller projects. Would, would this work the same for them? Because I see the, the costs are significant, $1,000 filing application, all those additional costs. Uh, would it be that same type of process? Would someone like, now that he moved on without us, Chester Selman at 21st in Kansas, who couldn't get through all the... I guess process for facade uh, legally because he's the parking lot between the building and the street. Is that something that he would be able to go through um, equally as big as or like someone that had a bigger project? Today, what the first goal was to try to introduce this new concept. If if everybody's amenable to us taking some next steps, that would be our next steps too. Would be to analyze 
what does this new retooled program look like as it relates to the CID umbrella and all the costs associated with that versus kind of how we've structured the program as it exists today. So what, what we'd like to probably do is if, again, if everybody's okay with kind of us taking next steps, what we'd like to do is come back with sort of a package deal that kind of shows some of those side-by-side -side comparisons as well. We'll, okay. we'll, need to, we'll need to recover our costs, and that's really how we set the fees. But the advantage is, is now you've got a larger project, right? So it, when they're looking at the, well, I've got a $1,000 application fee or whatever, now that you're going to include landscaping, potentially parking improvements and others, now suddenly not, you've got a project of more mass and that can make a difference. Yeah, I mean, it, it sounds amazing, honestly. I'm looking forward. So, yes, I'm, I'm supportive of that. Um, as far as areas go, I'm definitely supportive of the ECA, the nodes from um, Places for People. But I don't know if all of those take in. I'd also like to see consideration for areas that have not had investment that might be outside of the node. So I'm thinking 17th and Hillside is one of those nodes that was talked about. But if you go down a little west of 17th and Grove, there's this little small strip center that's been vacant probably 30 or 40 years. And it's outside of a node, but could structures like that be considered, which I know is a lot more work for us to identify. But if there are areas that haven't been invested in, I mean, that could really change a whole neighborhood if we were able to get that going. Yeah, uh, I would say let us now take some of those next steps, identify some of those geography in a, a more visual way for you to kind of see where we think that a version 1.0 of this retooled tool might look like, uh, as well as those side-by-side -side comparisons of costs. Um, and then something that we can always do a little bit to the comment about uh, even outside the ES ECA, right, is we can set up a structure that says, hey, look, w within these areas, here's a tool within the toolbox. And, and it's somewhat of a guaranteed, here's the path to get that approved. Outside of that, we can still entertain the use. The state statute allows us to use the CID even out of these areas that we've talked about, but perhaps that has somewhat of a, a different set of rules and regulations to play by, right? So if there's an area outside the ECA that wants to take advantage of this, what are those rules and regulations look like, so to speak, first, or what are those other areas if it's not within a specific year that we've already identified? How can we get folks to take advantage of that? Absolutely. Maybe it's a, a review by a, a subcommittee or something like that that makes a recommendation. We, we can get creative with some of those other things. There's currently no restriction on geography with the CID. It just That's has correct. to be 100% of the property owner That's has correct. to sign off on it. So that would probably be the most compelling argument as to where it can go. Correct. Well, except you'll want it to be a redevelopment project, right? I mean, you don't want well, this we to be... Well, we have to have that return. I mean, it yeah. still has to have an increase in property tax value. Right, but you could have that in a commercial strip center on the edge of town, right? Right. Well, the quite, again, that, you'll make that decision. Uh, we were looking at more in terms of uh, uh, redevelopment or uh, opportunities in areas that have been underdeveloped. Uh, under as long spent. as we're not giving any grant dollars, we're not out anything. As long as we get our cost recovery, we're going to get the increase in the property tax value. Right. Oh, yeah, you're just broadening the public policy. Right, but yeah. again, we're not out anything in this. Correct. So, for example, we we're talked a little bit. It. We, we talked a little bit well, about this, right? That currently, the way special assessments are somewhat structured in the is it's the city's borrowing power. The city is selling the bonds, right? And the the property owner is repaying the city through specials. So that's my next question. Correct. So where, in those areas where maybe it's outside of those areas that we want to see investment, maybe it's, okay, well, it's got to be pay as you go, right? It's got to be, <laughs> hey, we'll, we'll get the approval, and then you can go monetize the approval, that's, and you're going to have to go get your own file. It could be a situation like that. And where is this going to affect our debt capacity, right? In that situation, yes. And how is that going to limit us for capital improvement projects that we need to do that may have bigger price tags than what we're currently envisioning in our CIP. I'm just thinking of the convention Absolutely. Center. My right. recommendation is we start transitioning away from the city using their bar and going to more of a traditional pay-as-you-go type of program and some of the, but maybe there are some projects in areas that we would be willing to do that kind of stuff. There are some nuances with this that we still got to yeah. try and navigate and that's why I want to be able to come back to you in the next couple of months with kind of a program layout showing where we think this ought to work and it but this was just sort of first steps. Now, again, I, I applaud the, the 
the approach and the solution, worried about debt capacity and how that may affect it. Totally so, agree. Thank totally you. Agree. And then our credit rating. Yep. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Great job. Another good hire, it looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Vice Mayor, that's all we have today. Thank you. Any other questions or anything for the good of the group? If you're Council traveling. Member, Council Member Fry, positive comments on the CID. Today is great. <laughs> Holiday season has started early. Something to be thankful for, right? <laughs> as long as it's on special assessments. <laughs> Let's be clear. Thank you again to staff and uh, hope if you're traveling for the holidays or your family or friends are traveling for the holidays that it's safe and everybody enjoy a couple days off. I do want to say too, tomorrow is the last day that Lynn, our administrative assistant, will be with us down in the council office. I have truly enjoyed having Lynn work with us and be able to learn from her in the time that we're here. The law department is lucky to get her and uh, we'll have to have some probably treats brought down to help console us for that. But we wish Lynn well in her new adventure and look forward to bringing in a new staff member. But happy Thanksgiving, everyone. <laughs>